I don't know about you, but I get lots of emails forwarded to me. Some of them are funny. Some of them are not. Some of them are appropriate for church. Some of them are not. But this week I got a good one titled Christmas Shopping. This is what it said. A couple was in a busy shopping center just a few days before Christmas. The wife suddenly noticed that the husband had disappeared and because they had a lot to do, she started to panic and so she called him on the cell phone. Where are you? You know we have lots to do. The husband replied, do you remember that jeweler that we went into about 10 years ago? And you fell in love with that diamond necklace, and I couldn't afford it at the time, but I said that one day I would go back and I'd get it for you. Little tears started to swell up in her eye and roll down her cheek, and she got choked up, and she said, yes, yes, I do remember that shop, sweetie. And he said, well, I'm in the pub right next to that. It seems like during Christmas, I have some of my most interesting encounters with people at the stores. For example, this week, I was in Walmart getting some things for the kids. And um, there was a random lady who was there, and she was in the electronics section. She was looking for a new phone. And she engaged me in conversation. She said, "Um, excuse me. Would you talk to me for a minute? I said, sure. I said, um, I-, I live in Green Hills, and uh, I never come to Walmart, but, um, but I need a new phone. And, and so I-, I said, well, I-, I-, I live in Green Hills, and I love coming to Walmart. This place is great. She said, well, um, well I don't come, you know, leave Green Hills very often, but, uh, but I need a new phone for my, my house. And-, and-, and the ones at the AT&T store are just way too expensive. So I came here to Walmart. Do you think that this $20 phone will do what I need at my house? And um, I want to say, uh, lady, the reason they're so cheap is because nobody has a landline anymore. <laughs> but she was having a hard time, and, uh, and so she really didn't think she could take that cheap phone from Walmart back to her house in Green Hills. Fascinating. There was an article that appeared about a year ago, Christmas of 2014 in the, in the Tennessean, written by Beverly Keel. And it was a letter to Santa asking him to help us move past the materialistic side of Christmas to the much deeper and more spiritual side of Christmas. She said, stuff has become a substitute for real relationships, connections, self-esteem, and time spent with our loved ones. Consumerism is an empty escape from reality, one that is only momentarily satisfied because it ultimately can't fill the empty and lonely voids that haunt and taunt us. I hope that as we enter into this final stretch of Advent leading up to Christmas Day, that we can begin to really focus on what Christmas is all about. The birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We started this Advent journey Thanksgiving weekend, if you recall, and we lit the first candle on the Advent wreath, which was for hope. And we talked about how hope and faith are synonymous. They, they go hand in, in hand. And um, we talked about how there's lots of people in our world and in our community who live in a hopeless state. They live without hope. The next week, we lit the candle for peace. And we talked about peace and Specifically, I raise the question, what does it mean uh, to be a peaceful person? Because if we worship the Prince of Peace, then I think all of us are called to to do our best to be peaceful people, right? And so uh, what does that mean? I think that it involves forgiveness. And I think that it means that you can't be a control freak. I think it means that you don't get tangled up with non-peaceful people who like to pick fights. It means that you learn to be present in the moment because in the West we have a really big problem with that now. And it also means that you've found peace with yourself. Last Sunday we lit the third candle on the Advent wreath and we talked about joy. 
And again, we drew the distinction between joy and happiness. Happiness is fleeting. It comes and goes. Happiness is dependent on external conditions, oftentimes things that are outside of your control. But joy is much deeper. Joy radiates deep within, and it it, it stays there whether you're happy or not. And today, we light the fourth candle for love. Christmas is all about love. God's love for us, our love for God, our love for each other. If you had to sum up all of the scriptures that we've looked at during the Advent season with one word, that word would be love. The love and wisdom of the prophets in foretelling the birth of Christ. The love that Mary and Joseph had for the Christ child that was born in the stable. The love that the wise men showed as they journeyed to see that child And they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. The love of the shepherds as they went with great haste and determination to see what the angel had made known to them. And the love of God who sent his son into the world to give us life. A poet said, love came down at Christmas. Love all lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas, stars and angels gave the sign. This morning, we turn to the fourth gospel. We have four gospels in the New Testament. Three of them we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they're similar, slightly different. But this morning, we turn to John's gospel. And John's gospel is different. Uh, John was written in Ephesus sometime around the end of the first century by St. John the Apostle. By the end of that first century, you have to think about what has happened within the Christian world. There were two things going on. Christianity had gone out into the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, largely due to the writings, the letters, the missionary travels and teachings of the Apostle Paul. But because of that, Christianity had to be restated because of the growing number of people who were not familiar with the Jewish context and worldview. The fourth gospel does not mention John by name, but we learn about him in the other gospels. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the one that was next to Jesus at the Last Supper. And you might recall that it was John who was there at the crucifixion, and and Jesus told him to take care of Mary, his mother. One theologian described the gospels this way. Mark suits the missionary with the clear-cut account of the facts of Jesus' life. Matthew suits the teacher with his systematic account of Jesus' teachings. Luke suits the minister or the priest with his wide sympathy and his picture of Jesus as a friend to all. But John is the gospel of the contemplative. John is the most spiritual of all the gospels. Clement of Alexandria once said, John was not just interested in the mere facts of Jesus' life and ministry, but in the spiritual meaning of those facts. John was after the truth. John did not see the events of Jesus' life and ministry as just simply events in time, but as windows looking into eternity. And some would even say that John's gospel is a spiritual commentary of sorts. But the language of the fourth gospel is beautiful, and it's poetic. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is one of the most challenging and intriguing texts in all of the New Testament, because here John unveils his understanding of the mystery, the great mystery of the Incarnation. But what do these words tell us about the nature of Jesus Christ? What do they tell us about the nature of God? You see, for 70 years, John the Apostle had lived his life and he had thought about the life and the teachings and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He had reflected on those day by day and the Spirit had worked on him and had moved him. And then later in his life, he decided, I need to put this down into an account. And so he dictates what we now call the fourth gospel. He wanted to give his theological interpretation of what 
the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth had meant. And so he writes words like, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that enlivens every person was coming into the world. Remember the words of the prophet Isaiah who foretold the birth of Christ? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. And while Matthew and Luke's version of the birth account involved the shepherds and the the wise men and the angels and the the nativity scene that we put on here last week it walked through Bethlehem John tells the story of Jesus's birth in his gospel by saying the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory the glory of a father's only son full of grace and full of truth Jesus came to teach us how to love. This is a season of love. But unfortunately, we're not always very good at loving. We're not always good at loving the people in our lives that deserve our best. In fact, you could say that sometimes we treat strangers and people that we barely know far better than we treat our own family members, our spouse, our children. And there has to be a reason for this. This inability to love when we say that love is so important. There has to be a reason. The book of 1 John, we find what I think is one of the most profound passages of Scripture, but specifically we find an incredible verse in that passage. You know what it says? Perfect love casts out fear and you can also flip that and say perfect fear casts out love perfect love casts out fear and perfect fear casts out love the reason that so many people have such a difficult time loving others is because their lives are full of fear and I think that this has become a defining challenge in our culture. And I told our staff this week that if the church can't be a place where people can come to confront and ultimately overcome their fears, then I'm not sure why we're here. This would make a great apartment complex in the middle of Green Hills. The church must be a place that helps people confront and overcome their fears because we live in a culture that is full of fear and it's full of anxiety. Anxiety is wearing people out. Terrorism is wearing people out. An inability to agree and get along with people is wearing people out. The opposite of fear is love. And the only way to drive out fear, according to the Bible, is to learn to love better. And Jesus came to teach us how to love. And so think about some of the hymns that we sing at Christmas time. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now we need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. These familiar hymns tell us what Christmas is all about. But sometimes we sing them and we don't pay attention to the words. Let me ask you a question this morning, five days before Christmas. What do you need this Christmas? Not what do you want. Not what do you want Santa to bring you. What do you need this Christmas? What do you need that can't be bought at the Green Hills Mall? What do you need that can't be wrapped up and put under the tree? 
I mean, we're all going to get some, some gifts later this week, and they'll be, they'll be great. But it may not be what we need. Amy Grant wrote a song a number of years ago. You all are familiar with Amy Grant. And if you drive around town and listen to uh, 92.9, they play Christmas music all the time, um, you'll hear this song in December a lot. The song is called My Grown-Up Christmas List. And the words say, Do you remember me? I sat upon your knee. I wrote to you with childhood fantasies. Well, I'm all grown up now, and I still need help somehow. I'm not a child, but my heart still can dream. So here's my lifelong wish, my grown-up Christmas list, not for myself, but for a world in need. No more lives torn apart. The wars would never start. And time would heal all hearts. And everyone would have a friend. And right would always win. And love would never end. This is my grown-up Christmas list. What's your grown-up Christmas list? What do you need this Christmas? Somebody once said, if our greatest need had been information, then God would have sent us an educator. And if our greatest need had been technology, then God would have sent us a scientist. And if our greatest need had been money, then God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was for a savior. And so God sent his son to teach us how to live and to teach us how to love. The word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and full of truth. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's why we sing. That's why we rejoice. And that's why we love. Amen.